The whole congregation of Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they've gathered on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard you complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of Israelites, Draw near the Lord, for he has heard you complaining. As Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp. In the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When Israelites saw it, they said to one of another, one another, Is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Well, my friends, it is good to be with you today. Thank you for the privilege of just in the uh, time of gathering to be able to scroll through the, the screens and see the images of your face that have brought many memories to me. I think the only thing that would make this time better is if I was with you back home in the Northwest, but I am grateful to be with you in this way. We have been thinking about you, and even this past week, the presidency was spending time holding you and all the people on the West Coast in prayer in what you have been experiencing with the uh, wildfires. And so I hope that that continues to improve and that uh, life for many of you can begin to uh, settle down and the healing and renewal can begin both for human life and for creation. So it's good to be with you. And it's my hope that as we share this time of worship today, and as we spend a few moments reflecting on the scripture that uh, Jensen and Cooper, Susie and Dean shared with us, that we will allow those sacred words and story to begin to speak to us in our midst and in the context of what we discover how God continues to move and bring blessings to our life. So over the past few weeks, the church has been focused on this exploration of the Exodus story. It's a great story of the developing relationship and covenant between God, Moses, and the people of Israel. And while this story is formed in a culture and context centuries ago, it is a story that continues to have relevance in our journey and context today. In 2017, I had the privilege to travel to India to spend some time with the local leaders and members. 
As some individuals in the congregation community today, like uh, Dave and Carolyn Brock, Dave Anderson, Judy Luffman, and others who could tell you, when we travel into some of the developing nations of the world, we don't necessarily get to hang out in the popular tourist areas that the nation is usually known for. Our travel often takes us into the wilderness to reach the remote villages where the church is present. So on this first trip for mine to uh, into India, they had scheduled a trip out to one of the villages to share in worship. And they informed me that the journey would require a seven to eight hour drive one way through the jungle to reach the congregation where there would be hundreds of people who would gather. Well, I was grateful for the local leaders who tried to ensure that, that I would be cared for and taken care of. What they didn't know is that there was this sense of unease and anxiousness I felt as we drove out of the city into what felt like the middle of nowhere. You see, our travel didn't take us on comfortable paved roads, but on dirt and rocky roads filled with deep ruts that bounced you around like a ball in a pinball machine. There was no comfortable rest stop areas along the way. When we stopped for comfort breaks, the guidance always to me was, when you go out into the bush, keep an eye out for snakes and other animals. When the car I was riding in got a flat tire on the way back to the city and it was getting close to sundown, I could feel the anxiety and the uncertainty increasing as I felt that I had no control over my situation. I felt completely vulnerable in that space and time as I had no confidence that the worn out vehicle that I was riding in even had a spare. But when the driver did pull out a spare and I saw that it had hardly any tread on it, I began to envision the worst, being stuck out in the middle of the jungle, in the middle of nowhere for the night. I was hungry, my body ached, and I could feel that irritation starting to build up in me. As I reached that point and began to silently scream in my thoughts, get me back to the city. I can tell you though, there were more long trips during that uh, time, but I can assure you that I found a place of trust and discovered a sense of joy in those experiences. But being in an unknown, being in those unknown places of life is not a comfortable place for any of us. So when I read and listen to this story of Moses and the Israelites in their Exodus journey that was heard earlier today, in some ways I began to understand that kind of frustration that led the people to begin complaining to Moses and Aaron. You see, everything was different for the Israelites. You see, scholars estimate that the Israelites were in slavery in Egypt for about 430 years. So that means that there was absolutely no one in that caravan on a journey to the promised land of freedom who knew anything different than the bondage of slavery that they had left behind. So the wilderness was a place of hardship, a place of isolation, a place of danger, and the potential of starvation. So in their hunger and their frustration and the fear of being in the wilderness and wondering if they would even be able to meet their physical needs, they begin to complain. And even to the point in their own human dynamic, they begin to wonder if being back under Pharaoh's control and kingdom was a lot better than being stuck out in the middle of nowhere. At least if they were going to die, they'd be assured to have some meals and a shelter to comfort them. Six weeks into their journey of freedom, 
this group of people begin to have an emotional meltdown because everything in their lives had been framed up to this point of being in bondage. And in that despair, all they wanted to do was go back. They wanted to go back to what they at least knew. You know, it's amazing how fear and uncertainty can be so powerful as an emotion in our lives to have the ability to minimize our memory of the pain and the struggle that keeps us trapped in our own struggle and suffering. You see, the Exodus story invites us to ponder that essence of human struggle the kind of struggle and the barriers that keep us from encountering the new life God is seeking to provide for each of us. But it is also a story that endeavors to help us see in here that even in the midst of our own human struggle and the barriers that we place up, that frame how we live, how we see, and how we respond in the world, God continues to care for us. The wilderness, both as a place and as a condition of life, is not a barren place, but a place that is filled with the love and the grace and the goodness of life that God offers. You see, when the people were complaining and God did not, uh, God did not wait until they were done complaining before they re he responded. I don't know about you. I tend to get irritated with complaining. I remember as a kid growing up, many times my dad, when us kids were complaining, would say, if you want to complain, I'll really give you something to complain about. If I'm to be honest, I think I uh, said that many times to my own kids when I was fed up with their complaining. But in this story, God doesn't express frustration. God doesn't just tell them to shut up and to listen. God simply responds out of love and grace. The compassion for the people as he tried to offer for them this essence of life and understood that this new life of freedom that they were on was foreign to them. And yet at the same time, it was the place where God was calling them. But my friends, this is what's important. God did not respond dropping wonderful loaves of sourdough and all of the other kind of breads that, that you listed in the chats today. God did not drop all of those kind of breads from heaven onto the people. But God did provide the needed nourishment from the very source of life that was already present in that sacred place of creation, even if the manna came from bug juice. What had been barren in the place and eyes of the people hours earlier became a place of abundance and life. God wanted them to see that even though they had not reached the geographical territory, that would be the promised land where they were being led to. What God was offering them in their journey was an awareness of the promised space, the sacred space that they could count on wherever they were because God was with them. But my friends, 
if we listen to that story carefully, the people had a choice to make. Even with all that God had been providing for them, even in all of the times that God had demonstrated for them in that journey up to that place, God's care for them, they ultimately had to choose if they would long for what Pharaoh would offer them in Pharaoh's storehouse or what God would offer them, freedom and to live as a promised people even when they did not know what that felt like, looked like, or where it would take them. So as you and I encounter this scripture story today, for most of us, that's probably a familiar story. And then again, for some, this may be the first time of encountering this story. But what does this story that's told centuries ago, how does it begin to have any relevance in our context today? Drawing from some insights in my studies and reflections from Dr. Dwight Andrews, I think this story poses a critical question for us, both individually in our discipleship and in our collectiveness as a community of faith. And that question simply is this, are we living as a wilderness people or are we living as a promised people in the covenant of God's love? You see a wilderness people give in to the fears, the uncertainties and the discomfort and despair that eats away at their lives. When we live and function as a wilderness people, we begin to wall ourselves off to one another and see others as strangers who are different from us and too often treated as though they do not belong. We go into self-preservation mode. We hoard for ourselves and lose perspective of the welfare of the whole community of lives. A wilderness attitude and perspective yearns to hold on to what has been as we become more rigid instead of hopeful for what God is calling us to be and do. But a promised people, a people who trust in God's covenant of love, live with hope and trust and assurance that God is with us. Even when things are hard, even when life is not going quite the way we had envisioned, even when the answers to our questions and searching are not clear. A promised people live with love and know that they are on a journey, not alone, but share on that journey as part of the larger community of lives. To live as a promised people is to choose to see the abundance of God's blessings daily in us and around us. And as Barbara Brown Taylor reminds us, when we live this way, when we live with the awareness of the abundance of blessings that God shares with us, there will never be an end to the manna in our lives. You see, this is not about being more religious. This is not being about more structured. This is about being more authentic in what it means for you and me to live as disciples of Christ and to follow Christ, the peaceful one. It's about embracing and living the soul of community of Christ to fulfill its vision of God's peaceable reign on earth or what our heritage has called Zion, where every human life has an opportunity to be seen in the goodness and worth that was created in them. In 2018, I had the opportunity to travel to the nation of Nepal. 
And partway through that travel, I split up with uh, traveling with Apostle Rick Maupin. Rick went up into the northern part of the country to share with some congregations. And I went with one of the local leaders down into the southern part, down into the flatlands, where we were about 30 miles away from the India border. While there, teaching and sharing with the people, one afternoon, the leader and the pastor of that congregation in Britnagar said, I would like to take you out to visit one of our members in one of the villages of Sansari. He said, we'll have to be quick. We won't be able to spend a lot of time there because this is a Hindu village. And if they know that you as a minister are there, there could be problems. So as we drove for about 30 minutes out into the village area, we arrived at a location and walked to this man and woman's home. They began to share with me more the story of this husband and wife who in this village had encountered the message of Christ and encountered this community called Community of Christ and found a hope and a new message that brought meaning to their life. So profound was this change for them that their home that you see on the screen before you, they dedicated half of their home to be the church. So everything that you see from the door to the left of your screen, which is about just 10 feet, has been dedicated to be the church. And in that village of all Hindu believers, this man every week walks through the village to share his story and to invite others to come and to encounter the experience and joy of what he found in the gospel message of Christ and in this community called Community of Christ. But you see, it wasn't about trying to say to them, your Hindu beliefs are wrong. It wasn't trying to tell them and convince them that to be a real follower, that they had to come and now commit their life to Christ. This man and this woman just wanted to share with their Hindu neighbors the joy and the blessings of life that they found and how to live with them together in the spirit of sacred community and that the soul of community of Christ could be present in that place. In his writings to the, those in Corinth, the Apostle Paul reminds us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You see, I think that that's what Sean was trying to say to you last week in his message. Yes, Sean, I took some time to listen to your message and appreciated that. You see, Sean was trying to get you to recognize that to be caught in our fears, to pull back and to hold on to the way things have been, been keeps us from moving forward. And when we stop seeing the world and the suffering in human life through God's eyes, and when we stop moving forward, we become a people with no hope. But to live in the promised space, to live in that sacred space of God, is to choose to, to live, to being open to the new things that God is about to do in our lives and in our midst. You see, it's the value of the life journey that we share together to cherish the blessings of diversity and the blessings of sacred community, to pursue the acts of justice and peace in and through our lives, 
And in all of this, my friends, it's to trust that God is fully in our midst. This is the promised life and covenant that God yearns for us. Not because that we're somehow special and better than others. It is the promise and the covenant that God makes present for all, wherever we are found. And so today, in our worship, as we come together, as we think about how our lives have been fed, the Exodus story continues to remind us and to invite us to open our eyes, our mind, and our hearts to recognize the amazing things that God does and continues to do in human life even when it feels like tragedies are happening around all of us. In this story, God comes down to be with and to free a nation of people from slavery and bondage. And God does this by becoming the face of a simple man named Moses. As God journeyed with the people in the midst of their complaining and not un understanding what it was that God was trying to offer them, God still cared enough to show them the abundance available to them in God's creation and love. As God continued to be active and present in the midst of human life and history, God came even closer in the incarnation and life of Jesus, who became the face of God in the midst of the suffering and oppressed and to offer a different bread of life for the people. In the Gospel of John, Jesus simply says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. But my friends, what continues to be amazing is this, is that God did not stop there. God did one more incredible thing. God sent and offered us the Holy Spirit to be with us and in us and to form us as the promised people in God's love. And when God did this, God simply said, I will look like you in the world. You see, to live with trust, to live with hope, to live with the willingness to risk something new as a promised people, God makes you and me the manna for others who are seeking that promised and sacred place of freedom, of love, and the wholeness that comes when you know you are seen as a person of worth. May we live and serve and share as a sacred people known as Community of Christ, who are on a journey with God, who are called to be the bread of life in the world for those who hunger for love, justice, peace, and wholeness. Trust what is being born. Let us have faith in divine purposes. Continue to persist in hope. And let us be people who help others know the promise of God's love offered to all. This is my prayer and hope. Amen.